This week on Arizona Illustrated, Common Ground, Our Endangered Grasslands. They had a premonition that this could become a problem, and indeed by the 1930s and 40s it was a problem. All the major continents have this woody plant encroachment phenomena that have been happening over the last hundred years. Man on a musical mission. I think it has nothing to do with hands and feet and all that. It has to do with our ability to create new things, often out of nothing. And the rescuers, a look back. Hey Greg, I'm with Search and Rescue as well. My name's CJ. Ready to up rope, one, two, three. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. The Earth's surface continues to change in dramatic ways. Oceans are warming, glaciers melting, droughts expanding, and worldwide agriculture demands are on the rise. Locally, the native desert grasslands of southern Arizona are rapidly declining and are some of the most threatened natural habitats in the country. This is Common Ground. Most of Southeast Arizona, call it 150 years ago, roughly when the first big wave of white settlers came into the country, the country was just a sea of grass. Some of the early descriptions of the valleys of Southeast Arizona were just open grass from one mountain range to the next. And it was just a rancher's dream, this grass extending for miles and miles. And at the time, they simply didn't realize how fragile the country was. Woody plant proliferation in grasslands issue has been around for quite a long time. If you look at that old literature, people there started talking about the shrubs seem to be making inroads into grasslands. They had a premonition that this could become a problem. And indeed, by the 1930s and 40s, it was a problem. South America, Australia, Africa, for example, all the major continents have this woody plant encroachment phenomena that have been happening over the last hundred years. Elkhorn Ranch is a working ranch that has been in our family since 1946. Here at our ranch at Elkhorn, we found in the early 80s that conditions had evolved such that we had very dense mesquite densities in some areas. We had very little grassland cover and we had serious gully erosion. My name is Clara Miller. My sister and I are fourth generation ranchers at our ranch Elkhorn. We don't feed very much hay, so it's mostly during the summer they're turned out to pasture all the time. So having pastures that we can use, pretty big deal. In the 70s and 80s, they really focused on managed efforts to remove uh, mesquites. They've tried chaining, uh, which is dragging a big anchor chain across pastures and just knocking over mesquites and uprooting them, which had success, but it, it, it also leveled everything in its path too. So a lot of endangered species would be impacted by that. The grasses um, have a, a dense network of shallow roots which hold the soil in place and the structure of that perennial grass captures rainfall and, uh, and encourages it to infiltrate into the soil and really is, it plays an important role in watershed function. Places like the Altar Valley, we're in the uh, watershed of a major drainage that feeds the aquifer for Tucson. So a million people downstream depend for part of their water supply on the recharge from this valley. The 1900s, early in the 20th century, there was quite a controversy nationally about the role of fire. As a result of a large fire in 1910 that burned three states up in the northern Rockies, it forced the uh, policy decision to go toward total fire exclusion. Up until the 1890s, fire was a, a natural influence on the land. It was as natural as rain. 
Fire will kill the brush, stimulate the grass, relief nutrients to improve grass growth. So with fire, we can see a recovery of grassland and maintain that kind of dynamic equilibrium between grasses and shrubs. Excluding fire is ill-advised, and the application of prescribed fire is a legitimate and uh, most ecologically appropriate and inexpensive tool that we have at our disposal. People had been starting to use prescribed fire as a management tool to rejuggle the vegetation back towards grassland away from brushy um, type vegetation. And that program was very successful, but as a lot of the regulatory issues, Endangered Species Act compliance, as those laws became a bigger part of doing business, it became much harder to do these management practices. While everyone believes that prescribed fire is a very good management tool, we are finding that it is very difficult to implement. The word prescribed means there's a set of, of conditions within which you can do it, and outside of those prescribed limits, you can't. It's very easy in a, any given year to not have your prescription line up in a way that you can actually do the project. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you enjoy your stay where you're in all of this. Having a meeting between the Malpai Borderlands Group and the Altar Valley Alliance was a cross-boundary conversation. Getting the right groups of people together from those two initiatives, very place-based initiatives, plus a few other key resource people, to really tackle their priority issues on fire. And everyone has a kind of a piece of the solution, and you can see stuff getting done on the ground. You know, I was sort of retired last night from the evening conversation, and I was thinking, well, I don't know, it doesn't feel like we really have any obstacles. You, you all have diligently and persistently and doggedly cleared the trail. Morning everybody. Morning. Welcome to Pig Mountain. You're all experienced uh, in this fuel type and terrain. Be cognizant of where you're at and what you're doing. Be paying attention to the fire behavior and the topography. Please be safe and have fun and Realize that you're, you're part of a um, pretty symbolic day as well of, of trying to get a good prescribed fire going again in southern Arizona. We're going to break here and then we're going to head out here. We're going to start lighting. This ranch has been in operation since 1895, just shy of our 125th anniversary. And I think that's a pretty long legacy that speaks to caring more about the, the land itself, a way of lifestyle on the land, than just a short gain of money. We're always getting a better understanding of what the landscape should be, could be, would have been. conservation of grasslands as an ecosystem type is potentially a worthy goal. So it's not just about increasing forage production, but it's also about maintaining grassland diversity and biodiversity. It's maintaining habitat for game and non-game wildlife. It's about carbon sequestration. It's about potentially uh, uh, groundwater recharge and stream flow and a whole variety of ecosystem services. But brush management treatments they can be prohibitively expensive. It shouldn't be the responsibility of that landowner and that rancher. The public needs to say, we're willing to, to support efforts that will get us these benefits that we all need and enjoy. It's these place-based groups, collaboratives, that are bringing together, say, the rural producers, land landowners with environmental organizations and all the agencies and others. You can't help but feel optimistic because they just care about it so much. And so you get enough people together that care that much and you figure something good is gonna happen. 
It feels wonderful, you know, to be able to ride through an area and see a place that at one time it was sort of raw and ugly, and now you see it covered with vegetation and you see its shape more rounded. There's bigger plant diversity in that area. That's really satisfying. Music has always been at the center of his life, and over the years, he shared his knowledge and passion with countless young students at the U of A. This is a glimpse at the busy musical life of Timothy Kolasik and his journey to continue sharing the joy of music with others in the community. There are things that come into my life that are musical and have to do very often with leadership in music. My name is Timothy Kolasik. I was for 30 years a music theory professor, TA, part-time, all those things that you have to do in your early stages of your career. Three years at the University of North Texas in Denton and uh, 24 years at the University of Arizona. I was in for uh, 25 to life, but they let me off for good behavior. My father was really what I call a word person. It was centered around the development of ideas, philo philosophies, and words. Uh, my mother was more the intuitive type, and she played the organ. When she came to the, to the end of a piece, She would delay that last cadence and she would, she would do these kinds of phrasings with, uh, with soloists in the church and that sort of thing. So I began to notice that it wasn't just, you know, by the click. It was, there was a little bit of breathing and soul in the thing. I was 10 or 11 when the church bought a new organ and we had a gentleman come in and teach us the instrument and how to work with it an old Hammond. So I used this guy's basic training and started working with it and started playing around with it and didn't realize I was studying music theory. I got a, a Rotary Club grant to go to Vienna and study orchestral conducting and then decided, you know, there's more to learn from Vienna. Went back, did two more years, met my wife in my second year, married her in the third year, and then we went off to London. One of the important things about teaching music theory is to teach them to appreciate both sides of the issue, the intuitive and the theoretical. Then go to a piece of music and say, okay, how can we best discover the wonderful, joyful music that's inside of this? One of my proudest moments as a professor was the winning of the Five Star Teaching Award. And it signaled to me once again you belong in the classroom. Just stay here. And that's what I did for the remainder of my career. I have a, an ear training book that uh, I was taken on as a co-author with my major professor from the University of Wisconsin, so that has uh, uh, been effective as well. There's a land that is fairer than day. Found out that our pastor was a bluegrass guitar player. So we invited him over because we didn't have a guitar player who knew anything about bluegrass. Hello, come in, come in, come in. Hi. Welcome. A group called Sonoran Bells. Maybe I should have you move that to other sofa. <laughs> it's a community group made, of, made up of pretty much the best handball players in the city. and they rehearse in our living room. My big concert once a year as a conductor. Is the Tucson Music Teachers Association Piano Ensemble Concert. That is a wonderful conducting opportunity. 
but it's also a wonderful music education opportunity. As we met at the conservatory to start with, and I say to start with because I met him more than he met me. So we'll move quickly between monsoon storms. I know. <sighs> I was in the conducting class. I was trying to wrap up a teaching music education degree. Does this go on our table? That was at the Vienna Conservatory in... 74, fall of 74, because Helga's been playing with the Arizona Opera now for 28 years. It worked out to work together, and it worked out to work apart and in relationship to the kids. Well, now they'll know who we are. Another musical mission is the music for dance, for ballroom. Okay, that's good. Okay, so let's start with number one. Uh, we have a band called Better and Better, and I'll set some levels. A kind of an all-purpose two-member dance band. It was his brainchild to do the band. On the other hand, I had always wanted to try my hand at the electric violin. What I enjoy right now is that I have a five-string instrument, so I can play some of the songs on the viola range. I play uh, a Yamaha keyboard, kind of cheap off-the-rack keyboard, and then I write backup tracks. Timothy is the one who says, oh, this would be fun to make into a dance song for us. What it does is it brings together a whole lot of things that I taught. The way in which chords follow one another, chord substitutions that can be used, but also the joy of providing people music that they can easily dance to and have that joy themselves. Well, there, there are studies that say that music actually changes your brain or can uh, enhance how you learn, how you see the world, um, your mood, and uh, so it's important. <laughs> It is said that mankind is created in the image of God. Well, if you look at that within the context of the creation narrative, who's the creative one? God is the creative one. We are built in his image. I think it has nothing to do with hands and feet and all that. It has to do with our ability to create new things, often out of nothing. Music can be approached from the idea of how do I make, how do I combine sounds and make them work, all the way down to the individual who has no, seemingly no creative abilities in music, but the ability to appreciate intuitively what another person has done. I have found that no matter what a person's ability, or performance skills, or creative abilities, there is a niche that they will find, but they will be able to use those skills joyfully at that particular level, whatever it may be. <laughs> you have all of this population all centered around the appreciation and creation and recreation of music, and it creates this wonderful community. This month, the Southern Arizona Rescue Association, or SARA, commemorates 60 years of volunteer search and rescue efforts. Averaging 100 missions a year and saving many lives in the process, SARA was formed 60 years ago after a tragic loss of life in Madera Canyon. Three Boy Scouts caught in a snowstorm perished from exposure. This is our story about the all-volunteer team at SARA from 2015. Bring them back over to you. Okay, 7 KJ. Well, Mike's coming back. I went to his voicemail. So I'm just going to go up to where Brian is right now and just watch the water level. I have a rock where it was, it's dropped. Hey, it's Deputy Ramirez, Sheriff's Department. How are you? Good. I got a message here that you're looking for, I'm assuming your wife. Okay. Have you heard back from her at all?
We have some deputies that are making their way up there. We have not had uh, verbal contact with these folks yet that are stuck on the other side of the washes. So as far as it being your wife, I don't know right now. So I just want to let you know as soon as I could about that. Uh, where does she normally hike at? On a winter day, two hikers are trapped by a torrent of rain. That's where I think they are. That's what. That's where the guess is, right there. Pima so County Sheriff's Deputy forward. Jeremy Ramirez I copy that. I'm at is the on the scene to manage the rescue. Okay. Yeah, you should be able to I'm with the search and rescue unit. Whether it be lost, injured hikers, walkaways, runaways, anything along the lines that we need, the patrol needs our assistance and our specialty for. I didn't want to commit all of our resources in case for some reason things start rising and then we're all stuck on the other side. Given the fact that our search and rescue unit is only comprised of eight deputies, we can't handle a lot of these calls on our own. We need help, we need assistance. That's when the sheriff's department calls Sarah. The Southern Arizona Rescue Association is an all-volunteer group of men and women who train to rescue those in need. When someone is lost or injured in the wilderness, Sarah members come out to find and help them. Typically have about 150 members of whom 60 or 70 will be feel qualified at a given time. It sounds like a very big group. When you're trying to carry a very heavy person out of the mountains, you need a very big group. Some pictures from, from some of those trainings, as you can see, working in the snow, working when it's excessively hot. Jane Larkendale has been a Sarah rescuer yeah, for 11 years. She helps lead the group's selection and training process. Training. There's the very basics of search, re technical rescue, the basic medical qualifications. That is what's required to become a field qualified member. That's going to take you about 70 hours. It's a big time commitment. Um, after that, you have a minimum of one year of training and apprenticeship, and you're going to have a more advanced medical class if you don't already have an advanced medical qualification. Would-be so, rescuers start by applying, there. and then some are invited on a hike that tests their fitness and teamwork. Those are the experiences you'll take your It's not like you get any grace period here. The day you go in the field, it's real. It's real. From there, Sarah selects its trainees. On evenings and weekends, over months, they learn to track, navigate... Hey, Greg, I'm with Search and Rescue as well. My name's CJ. ...and tend to others in the toughest terrain. Belay, uh, ready to up rope. One, two, three. Rotate clockwise. They work through rescue scenarios in daylight and darkness, right. in dry Walk. deserts and snowy mountains. Ready, haul team. Paul. Down rope blue. As they prepare Thank for the you. day when someone's life is really on the line. All right. And all right, really we're good. The so what, what we normally do at this, at this point is we just sort of sit down, take a break, get some food and water. But Eventually, they earn their yellow shirts and become candidate members who are eligible to go on calls with orange shirts, the more experienced members. They join a long line of rescuers with a history one Sarah member knows well. Yeah, my name is Marvin Stafford, and I've been a long-time member of the Southern Arizona Rescue Association. Uh, the time of my working with them goes back to what I call the first search in uh, November 1958. Marvin was 16 years old when he took part in the first search. He joined hundreds of other Arizonans in looking for three missing Boy Scouts who disappeared on Mount Wrightson in a snowstorm and who were later found dead. We know that they, in desperation, resorted to using the handle, the wooden handle of the axe, for firewood. So that's, that was the... That was the way they went down that night. You know, there were so many problems in that first search. There was jurisdictional problems between Santa Cruz and Pima County. There was the, the mixture of Forest Service and other government, uh, highway patrol, uh, military guys, all trying to work together, and they just didn't work well together at all because they didn't have the experience. There wasn't somebody overall in charge with the proper knowledge of being able to pull off such a thing as that with all those people. So the next spring, the attitude was, we've got to get organized. 
After a series of meetings, Two hikers dropped a vehicle at Catalina Sarah State Park. was born. A hiker rolled her ankle a short Over the years, it has grown beyond what its founders envisioned. So 50 years ago, it was a very small organization and a very informal organization. As time goes on, we're a bigger organization now. We have income coming in, we have, a, we have a permanent headquarters, which we have to maintain. So we've had to become a more formal organization from the administrative side. Also, the world has become a much more formal place. We work for the Sheriff's Department, they have risk mitigation, they have protocols that we have to maintain, so it's become more formal from that perspective too. And um, So I think a lot, of the, a lot of that has led to a more rigid, more structured environment. I'll stay here, plus okay. you need me back there. You ladies want to hop in and get a little bit warm? Yeah. And then um, I believe one of your husbands called earlier looking for you, so we told him where you were. That change has been hard on some members, but it has made Sarah an integral part of emergency services in southern Arizona. We work together a lot more. We do trainings together a lot more. There's more integration between the two agencies. You have to give them credit. They're volunteers. How many people would want to get called out from work, from home, middle of the day, summer 110 degrees, winter when it's 20 degrees, drive up to the top of the mountain, go help search from somebody at 9, 10 o'clock at night that you don't know? you got to respect that. Did you grow that basil? For Jane Larkindale and her husband, who is also a Sarah member, that balancing act includes two careers and raising a young daughter. But they say it's worth it for what it gives the community and for what it gives them. I think a lot of people decide to join because they want to help people. I think a lot of people join just because they're part, they're part of the outdoors community and think they can learn a lot, maybe make themselves self safer out there. I think what keeps people in is the camaraderie, the just, just loving to be out there, the sense of adventure, and also the adrenaline rush of you don't know what's going to happen. You might be going for a short walk or you might be out there for 12 hours and you just don't know. I think the people who survive thrive on that. You learn that you have reserves you didn't know you have. There was one occasion when I carried about 70 or 80 pound pack almost to the top of Mount Wright because we had a guy in a diabetic coma up there. Now we didn't do anything, the helicopter took him away before we got there, but knowing that somebody's life might depend on you doing that, you can do it. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week. Mm -hmm.